Right, I'm at it's three o'clock. So, welcome to the Cross District Armboff. Um, I'm Steve McIntyre. I've been doing Debian development for mm, quite lots of years. Um, I'm currently employed by ARM. I'm working on, in Linaro. Um, lots of hats, lots of things. Um, I know some stuff about ARM. I hope you lot do as well. Let's see what we can talk about. <clears throat> so, ARM Linux is a good thing. I want to talk about the hard float ABI because a number of people have been asking me about it. I thought we, we'd already pushed the message out. I'm happy to do it some more. If we can see where the, the different uh, Linux distros are, are up to with our ARM ports. I mean, some of us have been doing it for years. Some have just started on it recently. And it would be lovely to get working together. So why do we have ARM Linux? Well, because it's good. No, um, I'm assuming most of the people in the room here like Linux. Um, many people in the room here probably like ARM. They work really, really well together. Um, who's involved? ARM themselves now have a, quite a large team of software people, many of whom are working on Linux and free software. There's um, the new-ish non-profit group, Linaro. Has anyone here not heard of Linaro? Okay, I'll explain. Linaro is a consortium started by ARM and some of their silicon partners uh, about 18 months ago now. And their stated goal is to work together to make um, Linux and other free software work better on ARM. In much the same way as ARM hardware is shared amongst all of those silicon partners. You know, they come to ARM and license uh, CPU designs because it's easier and cheaper to do it to do it that way than to invent everything themselves. Um, the, you know, this is a brand new, fascinating idea. We'll tell you what. Let's work together on the software for the betterment of everybody instead of everybody doing all of their own Linux kernel ports, all of their own distro development. Um, it seems to be going quite well so far. ARM, uh, Samsung, Texas Instruments, Freescale, IBM and Canonical and are amongst the many companies you'll have heard of. There are quite a number of other companies involved at various levels in Lenaro. Um, and we, we do a load of work basically in the open source model, working work for, from home, working in offices, but mainly communicating by email, by IRC, and just working on cool stuff in the Linux environment. It, it's great. Um, We've got our next big get-together um, starts tomorrow in San Francisco. I'm going to be flying out there tomorrow morning. Um, we have four of those every year. There's lots and lots of cool stuff going on. Linaro.org if you're interested. Um, where are we up to? Um, we have, in the past, there the hasn't been a huge amount of interest in ARM for generic Linux distributions. Um, that's becoming less and less the case as time goes on, as the newer ARM CPUs are that much more powerful and capable of running um, the, f the full standard Linux software stack. Um, it used to be the case that, of course, um, people knew ARMs were, ARM CPUs were in mobile phones, but the mobile phones were always running some very specialized software stack. Um, which typically most, most end users would never even know about, let alone be able to work on. Um, in the next few years, you're going to see ARM um, CPUs in everything, all the way up from smartphones, desktops, hopefully notebooks, and servers. Um, there's a lot more use and a lot more, well, demand now to have generic Linux distributions running on ARM. That's why I'm here. So, the hard float ABI. Um, ARM in the past has suffered from a variety of different standards in terms of how software works. Um, I'll go through, go through the details very briefly. I don't want to bore people. Please shout if you think I am. Um, in the dim and distant past, the, the first really common ARM Linux ABI assumed that always your ARM CPU would have a floating point unit although that was approximately never the case. You know, it's a really good design. 
Um, so when you ran um, software that depended on floating point operations, um, the kernel would have to catch an exception for an illegal instruction, spend loads and loads of CPU cycles and, t and therefore time fixing up the, 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 the exception state to work out what instruction you just tried to execute, emulate that instruction, and then return back to your user land program. That did work, but by God was it slow. So we moved on to a newer version a newer design of ABI for ARM, oh, quite a number of years ago, called the eABI, which actually allowed for use of, hard of hardware floating point, but by default didn't expect it. So this is a much more sane way of working. Um, in case you didn't have a hardware floating point unit, you would copy all of your floating point uh, arguments and return values into and out of integer registers. Um, so, emulate floating point uh, hardware in user land without having to take the kernel exception cost. It was good, it was fine, and people were generally happy with it. So, we get forward to today with the latest version of the 32-bit ARM processor, the V7. Actually, now, everything does have hardware floating point. Not absolutely everything. It's still possible to do a V7 ARM without, but Again, approximately nobody does. So we've now got this ABI that's designed and optimized for a software um, implementation of floating point, even though we now have a hardware that makes that obsolete. Um, the cost of doing the copying, in, so if, if you have um, a function call into a library at the moment that does floating point arguments, you end up having to copy all of the arguments from the floating point register into in floating point registers into integer registers, do your call. In the function call, the, in the call E, you have to copy them out and back into floating point registers, do all the whatever work you wanted to do, which might just be a single, as potentially a single instruction. When you finished, copy the result back into the integer registers, return to your caller, the caller then has to copy the results back out of the integer registers into the floating point register where it was working on them in the first place. So that's four complete copies of all of those. Um, that's not very efficient if you don't have to do it. So what, we, what we've done with the hard float ABI is purely and simply say, well, let's use the floating point registers. It's really good. Um, performance depends very much on your workload. If you're doing a whole load of integer um, calculations, if you're just doing a compiler run or you know typical general code, you may never see any any benefit from this. It's you know we'll admit. If you're doing things um, like Povray, you know the um, renderer, that's a particularly good example of of a difference it can make. It's very recursive, using floating point everywhere. Uh, we have benchmarks that show that you can see uh, like a factor of three or even four times performance speed up doing the, doing the hard float. Um, that's a really big win. Now, of course, that's one extreme. What we're finding in terms of more general benchmarks is that current graphics libraries, uh, GTK libraries and related stuff, actually can see a 15, maybe 20% performance improvement on common cases. Because, of course, they're simply they're passing around floating point values internally. Um, it makes a lot of sense to do this. Um, on the desktop, it might not sound like much, but 15 to 20 percent performance improvement actually can, make, can be really quite noticeable. It means that you know, moving windows around, um, starting programs, everything can actually be noticeably quicker. It feels smoother. It's good to have. Um, Performance is the reason we started the RMHF work. However, the, the thing that's actually really now driving it forward is standardization. Um, over the, the years, we've had many, many, many different variations on a theme in the ARM world in terms of how people build their programs. Um, and for devices like, like cell phones where you're, you, you're going to ship one, one drop of software with the device. It's never going to be up uploaded. It's never going to be fiddled with. Nobody wants to be able to tweak it. That's fine. 
But of course, now we want, if we're getting to the stage where we want ARM devices to be general purpose computers, whether they're servers or desktops or whatever, um, it now helps if you can actually have one style of software, one set of standards, so that your binary from any one of those machines will work on any other. Obviously, modulo, you're actually having libraries installed and so on. But at least this way, we actually we, we want to have one standard ABI going forwards. Um, specifically, the most common thing, and again, you'll have seen this in the press and whatever, ARM servers are coming real soon now. Um, people who want to run um, ARM servers in the data center want, will want to have the choice of installing Debian or Red Hat or Ubuntu or SUSE. And they'll, they'll also want to be able to go to their, um, stand, to their preferred software vendor to go and install whatever, whatever other binary programs are available to be able to run their business without having a standard ABI then again, you'd have to have a completely different build for each different distro, at which point now the ISV market would never take off. We want to get something standardized. So moving on, and I'll get to your bit in a moment. In Debian, we've had three different ARM ports over the years, just basically following exactly the same ABIs as I've already mentioned. We had the original ARM port, which supported ARM, ARM version 3 upwards using the old ABI. Um, ARM Linux GNU is the standard uh, GNU triplet that describes that port. Um, and that worked very well. It's, it, you know, we did it for a number of years, and it's now dead. We then moved on to ARM EL, um, which supports V4T, which is version 4 of the ARM processor, including thumb instructions and using the new EABI, as I mentioned earlier. So that's a soft float ABI. And, and there's the, the, the GNU triplet to go with. And then just literally in the last couple of months, we've got ARMHF, which is the new hard float version of the EABI, and using Thumb2. It's targeting ARMv7 processors, so that's anything that most of the big vendors are now selling. So all of the uh, Panda boards, Beagle boards, um, the Freescale IMX series, the latest ones, are all on, v on V7. It's, you know, the Cortex-A8, Cortex-A9, um, all of the current work in ARM is ongoing on, on new versions of these processors. So we've come up with a new GNU uh, triplet, ARM Linux GNU EABI HF. I'll just set, go on, Ben. Right. What about Marvell? Marvell, until very recently, have not released any V7 processors. So a lot of the common things out there, the Goro plug, the Dream plug, are still running V5. Um, they have just started shipping some V7s, which should work just fine with, with ARM HF um, as, soon as, as soon as we people start testing on them. Um, so in Debian, this is what we're up to. And I'll show, hopefully that comes out. So this is showing um, the status of the different architectures in Debian. And you can see all of the, the, the existing architectures are basically up at the top of the graph. Um, that, this shows how much of the archive has been built on those, on those architectures. Um, we can see herd bumbling along at about 70%. I can't see it ever getting beyond that. Sorry, minor dig. Um, and back in the, at the beginning of December, we see down here, there's two new lines joining in. One of those is S390X, which is a new port to the IBM Z series mainframe, but using, again, a new ABI that's now 64-bit. And that's the green line. And the red line that goes next to it, and now is well up into the 90% range, is RMHF. Um, we've, done, we've had some incredible success so far. Um, basically based on the huge amount of work done by Konstantinos Margaritis, in, work, work, another Debian developer who works for Genesi, who also sell um, ARM-powered devices. You know, obviously they're keen to see this work. Um, he did a huge amount of port work in the unofficial Debian ports archive. He and I have been working to transfer that over into the main Debian archive, and um, it, it's gone very well. We're quite happy. There's still a few things to go. 
we still got bugs to fix. Um, I've got a lovely one at the moment where Ruby or pthreads or maybe both conspire to cause uh, test suite failures. Um, LibreOffice has a few issues that stop us building it at the moment. We've, we need to fix those. We've got some language bootstraps remaining. We need to bring up uh, Common Lisp. Um, the Mono um, developers are asking for help in doing, an, in doing a small amount of port work to make ArmHF work um, for Mono. And basically, literally just in the last couple of weeks, we've started migrating into Debian testing. Um, along with the other architectures, so there's a very good chance, and we're really hoping that we're going to ship RMHF with Wheezy. Um, in Ubuntu, um, there have been two ARM ports. They only came into doing ARM work for quite recently. Um, the first one they did was ARMEL, but it's different to ARMEL in Debian, just to cause confusion. They have basically done um, version 7 EABI soft float, again with uh, Thumb 2, and, but they've called it, it's just exactly the soft float version of ArmHF. Um, in the last uh, few months, uh, ArmHF has also been bootstrapped in Ubuntu. They're up to a similar point as we are in Debian. Um, obviously, as we're quite close, um, the, the two teams are working together to get the la same last few bugs fixed. Again, we're hoping that uh, the next Ubuntu release, Precise Pangolin in April, will also ship with ArmHF. Um, it will be nice, lovely to get into that because that's going to be an LTS release. So, that's where we're up to. I'm not going to talk much longer because I'm getting bored of my own voice. I don't know about you lot. So, where's everybody else up to? Sousa, who wants to talk? It back. Um, yeah, Suzy started their port effectively from scratch um, end of September. Uh, we're now sitting at just under 86% uh, the full distribution ported over um, using ArmHF um, as our primary target. We do have a, a V5 soft float port sitting there as well but that's not our focus that's predominantly for people that have the likes of the guru plugs and uh, such like um, so if anybody wants to chip in and move that along by all means come and join in um, but yeah no we predominantly uh, targeting v7 upwards uh, hard float um, so yeah we're slowly getting there uh, biggest issues for us are predominantly the kernels, a um, wide variety of them uh, with some uh, spurious sources uh, and obviously accelerated graphics uh, and for that matter even basic 2D graphics as a result of kernel issues are one of the issues as well that we're encountering. Okay, Fedora? Anybody here know about Fedora Arm? Deathly silence. <laughs> um, I, okay, I'll, I'll chip in. I'm not a Fedora developer, never have been, but I have been following along a number of the, of the other distros, including the SUSE and Fedora builds. Uh, Fedora basically at a similar kind of situation. They've got, again, two ARM ports, um, soft float v5 and hard float v7. Um, again, they're hoping to be able to get stuff into the next release. There's a lot of work to be done, um, not necessarily in terms of building for ARM, but also actually getting in sync with the rest of Fedora, because, of course, you know, it's, always an, it's always a moving target. You never know until you get close to a release if you're actually going to be shipping with it. Um, any Gen 2 folks around? Yeah. Well, okay, uh, honestly, I'm not really the most active uh, member of the ARM team, but... Uh, I mean, being a source-based distribution makes mm. things easier in some ways. Uh, and we have uh, stages on the, the ARM v7, and we have ARM v5-based uh, systems, and that seems to be working just fine. The number of keywords uh, and the number of packages that are actually keyworded for ARM is increasing. Cool. Uh, 
So I, 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 I see it kind of working. I even have unconfirmed reports of people running KDE. So, uh. Cool. Oh, do you know, are they, the V7, is that soft float or hard float? <laughs> uh, well, I'll try to figure it out. I don't know. I just have an OpenRD ultimate, so. Okay. Sorry? You can use both. Okay. Of course, yeah. Um, right. <laughs> right. I know the Majea folks were all quite in, interested in ARM, or at least a couple of their developers have been making a lot of noise, but I don't know if there's anybody around. Yep. Uh, I know the Arch Lima. Okay, do you want to pass the mic forward? I... It's on. I know some of the Arch Linux guys uh, have ARM uh, ports uh, working. Uh, I think it's ARM v7, uh, but not sure. Uh, they will have to test. Okay. On, on from Algeria, I agree. I couldn't see uh, starting a v5 port, but we plan to do also ARM ARM port. Okay, excellent. Um, so fingers crossed. You know um, the what what we've been pushing, as I said in. Um, Linaro and in ARM, which is to go for the hard float port. That does seem to be working all round. Um, Android, yes, of course, is, an, is another interesting use case. Um, we've had um, some contact with the, with the Android folks. I mean, there's an Android team in Linaro as well, and they've been exploring building as hard float. Um, just for the sake of the extra performance, the Android team seem to be quite interested, but of course they have they they have next to no interest in following standards for the sake of sharing binaries. You know, I'm sure that won't come as a shock. Um, the thing about um, hard float is again I shall should explain is it doesn't matter about what kernel you run. You can run soft float and hard float binaries on top of the same kernel. Um, it's just entirely about user space interfaces, and that's the place where Android is so totally different from, from all of the other Linux distros that there isn't a huge amount of sharing going on. Ben. Uh, so I uh, just wanted to do you a couple of questions. Firstly, what is the recommended lifetime of the V5 ports? Are they going to disappear anytime soon? To be honest, it, it'll depend on a lot on community support. Um, I mean, in Debian, we're still running with V4T, and we have been for a number of years. We've got so many people out there with V4 and V5 devices that we're not going to... The plan is very much we're going to keep RBL and RMHF going in parallel for the foreseeable. Um, well, exactly. As Wookie says, a lot of people have gone out and bought Shiva plugs with their own money. They're going to be very upset if we suddenly say, oh, no, we don't care about you anymore. Who's, somebody's trying to ring me. Joy. Um, in the other distributions, I guess it'll be a similar story. The people who've been out and bought, you know, the Shiva plugs, the Guru plugs, whatever, to, to be able to do their own small home servers based on those, well, of course they're going to want it to, want it to continue. Um, ARM and Linaro explicitly, of course, are targeting brand new devices. And all of the Lenovo member companies are, are more interested in V7 than V5. So that's why we've had most of the push has been for the hard float ABI. Um, as we go forward, um, of course, I don't know, has, has anybody heard about ARM V8? Right. Has anybody not heard about ARM V8? Fine, there'll be some. Basically, ARM V7 is the last, so far, ARM ABI, or ARM processor design, that is only 32 bits. ARM V8 is the point where ARM will finally be, be producing a fully 64-bit machine. So you'll get all the, all of the usual benefits of larger address space, potentially more registers, more instructions, all kinds of good things. And it's seen as critical when, as ARM moves into, into servers. Um, the important thing about V8 is, of course, it'll also continue to run all of V7 instructions and hopefully should be just as fast at running those as, as the previous V7 machines were. Um, OMHF is very much the solution to running 32-bit systems. 
uh, on V8. I th that's one of the reasons why we're standardizing it. We're even hoping that we might be able to get through LSB certification and have ARM added as an LSB architecture. It's not there yet, there's still work to be done, but we're hoping for it. Yes, do you want to pass the mic back then? So still about uh, ARMv8, what, uh, what if applications want to use uh, more than six, um, 4 gig of RAM? In that situation, well, they will, um, a single application using more than 4 gigs will yeah. need to be written to be V8. So it will need to be compiled to run you know, the, the new instruction set, the new architecture. Um, in terms of, machine, of systems where you may want more memory than, 16, than 4 gig, but you, you're not necessarily bothered about program running that, then the latest um, Cortex-A15 processor will include virtualization extensions and um, LPAE, so you can have large amounts of memory available. Similarly to what Intel did before they went fully 64-bit, um, you'll be able to have many, many processes or threads all running with, large, with you know, a reasonable amount of memory but you'll be able to have one single machine supporting all of them at once. Oh, you want to pass the mic across? So this is maybe slightly less of a distro-related point, but yeah. since I'm here with Zen.org, I thought I'd mention that we've got um, Zen working now more or less on ARM. We haven't got any tool or guest support yet, but we do have a DOM naught that boots to a shell prompt. Cool. And uh, we're expecting to get that stuff into our tree very soon um, and in the next few months we should expect to have a working ARM proper port that you can run everything you like on. Uh, that works, however, only on hardware that doesn't exist yet. So we're slightly <laughs> ahead of the curve. <laughs> uh, that's the yeah. um, virtualization extensions that um, Steve was just talking about. Yeah, on A15. Uh, KVM, I believe, is meant to be up, on, up and running on A15 in models at the moment, but I could be wrong. Uh, the QMU folks are also looking at A15 and uh, virtualization and, extend, and e expanded memory. There's a, there's a lot of work still to be done there. Sorry? Yes, PVOps. Um, well, actually, I mean, you say PVOps. We're, we're talking about essentially upstream Linux kernels here. Uh, the changes you need to make to get it to run as a DOM naught are trivial. Okay. Right. Do we have any other updates from any of the other distros I might not have thought of? Any other qu questions, please? So I, <clears throat> I'm, um, I'm both a Debian developer and a Mozilla developer. So my interest is to know um, your experiences with testing. So uh, one of the problems with ARM is that there are so many different levels and different socks and stuff like that. And uh, for example, in Debian, I've had the problem that uh, some packages wouldn't, wouldn't really work on ARMv4 while mm -hmm. we're targeting it. And we're actually building on ARMv5, so we have some problem testing it to actually know if it works in, on, on ARMv4. And uh, relatedly, um, at Mozilla, we, have, uh, we are trying to get uh, Firefox running on ARMv6. And uh, while the builds we have uh, run on ARMv7, mm. they don't on actual ARMv6 because of fancy stuff like page coloring. So, yeah. uh, so I would like to hear about your experiences on testing sure. on various architecture. Yeah, I mean, of course, the fun thing um, in Debian, the reason that we're still supporting V4T is, is, as far as I understand, basically the OpenMoco is the last V4T processor out there that people really care about. Unfortunately, it's also a really, really small machine where the, the prospect of building or running Firefox is scary. <laughs> um, it actually runs. Well, it used to. <laughs> sure. I mean, I guess, are you Mike? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think we actually met before. Um, but, of course, the problem is that 
building for v4 and testing on v4 are two different things. Um, so while we can have the tool chain running on v5 and targeting v4 and it, it, we're happy it mostly works just fine, you know, modular the occasional bug, running, actually finding v4ts that we can test on is very difficult. Um, equally, for, even more so finding a v4t that's big enough to be able to do useful testing. Um, I don't really have a sol solution to that. If you have any su suggestions, <laughs> um, and again, a similar thing uh, with V7, V6. Um, there are a lot of ARM V6 devices out there, but most of them are fairly locked down and built into, mo into mobile phones and so on. In terms of finding a generic accessible V6, um, it's not so easy. So, yes, the Raspberry Pi is actually one of the, one of the very few that I'm aware of. Uh, the Beagle is V7. So, of course, at the moment we've got the, the big split almost from V5 to V7. The Raspberry Pi is, is a V6 and is fairly well known. Off the top of my head, I mean, I work for one, but I couldn't tell you all of the V6 CPUs out there. Um, it all depends on what the silicon partners have done. I don't know, Wookie, can you think of any? No, it's V5. <laughs> okay. The, the, there are a few SOCs, but actually getting hold of them to be able to do useful testing or whatever with them is difficult. I believe all, just about all of the Marvels until very recently were V5. I'm not, I don't know of any Marvel V6s. Yeah. Um, so yes, Mike, it's a, you have good questions and I wish I could give you an answer. <laughs> Um, basically, V5 and V7 seem to be the sweet spots in terms of building and targeting, um, just because of the sheer number of uh, different SOCs available. Um, it's the best thing I can suggest. I mean, to be honest, actually, quick show of hands, does anyone here have an open MoCo? Does anyone here actually use their open MoCo? <laughs> right, Wookie, he knows how to build his own stuff. Would anybody, would anybody here, see anybody here care? much if Debian stopped supporting V4T. One, two, three, four. Okay. Not that I'm suggesting we're going to do it. I'm just curious, I'm honestly curious because it, it is a, a question that comes up regularly as why are we doing it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, we will end up at some point in the future dropping V4T. I think we can guarantee that. We have another question at the back. Okay, can we pass the mic back? I said I couldn't hear that either. So yes, as I was saying, there are pretty. Uh, quite a lot of devices running serious logic, EP93XX SOCs, okay. and those SOCs also have VGA display most of the time, so having a full-blown Debian can make sense. Okay. Now, uh, what you can get as a, I don't know, I'm, I mean as a, an individual, it's just the simple, simple machine, SIM1 board or something like that, so mm. if you drop it, I, I won't beat you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Sorry, Rob? Oxford Semi have some V6s as well, apparently. Fine. Um, they don't exist anymore, I'm told. OK. Um, right. Do we have any questions about actually porting things to ARM? Uh, yeah. Ah, Andrew. One of, uh, like I mentioned, one of the issues that we have with porting Susie's farm is the breadth of kernels for each SOC. Um, yeah. What's the status of device tree 
for trying to flatten. <laughs> ben seems to be keen to answer that. <laughs> I think there's a big, actually, the sort of the question is slightly wrong. It's not the device tree that's important. It's actually getting the kernel to build for multiple different systems because we've got the V4, V5, V6, V7 problems, and we've got a whole pile of SOC support which doesn't quite yet all exist, all exist happily together. I mean, mm -hmm. Linaro have been doing a lot of work with the community in this with trying to get it so you can compile a kernel but the existing booting way should still work for the existing machines. It's just getting the kernel to support it. I mean. yeah. As we move forward on V7, one of the biggest targets for the Lenovo kernel team is to have the single Z image that will boot on any V7. Frankly, being brutally honest, and I might get beaten up for saying this, it's probably never going to happen that we'll support all of them. But at least for the commodity devices that all of the current silicon vendors are pushing now, um, the landing teams are trying to get together to get, using device tree, you should be able to get all of those systems running on a single uh, Z image. Um, that is the holy grail. It's exactly where we want to get to, for example, for servers. We don't want to have to have 15 different kernel flavors to be able to support the machines because, frankly, that's a mess. Yeah, device tree produces a very useful of actually not having to keep changing your kernel but the old booting method with a machine yes. number is actually quite valid even for a multi-image kernel mm. so. yeah um i said the uh, i'm curious actually is anybody else you know actually being entirely selfish has anybody else seen any problems with ruby on arm no <laughs> yay <laughs> I'll just say I met a man last night who seemed a very keen Ruby developer who was, was remarkably keen to help solve this issue. Okay, so cool. uh, I think we should just talk to them. Yeah. Apparently there's all sorts of problems with Ruby threading, so it might not just be us. Sure. Um, equally, the one thing that I was quite surprised to find actually was um, I could not find any pthreads uh, torture tests out there available. Um, there's a number of area of test suites available for testing different bits of pthreads and make sure it meets the spec. But in terms of doing really evil, nasty shit, you know, like spawn 10,000 threads and have them do all kinds of things in the one order and make sure the white answers still come out, I'm not aware of any. Please, I'd love for one of you to be able to tell me I'm wrong and that there's one out there. Please? <laughs> oh, arse. <laughs> Right, Wookie's mic doesn't seem to be working. Right, if Wookie says there was a guy, there was a person from Fedora wanted to talk to him about multi arch. Um, if so, he, he doesn't know who you are. Please grab him now because he's going to be leaving and running away in an hour. Um, multi arch is a big thing within Debian and Ubuntu at the moment. Um, it's a major technical goal that we've been, we've been working on for far longer than it should have taken. But it is very much the right answer in the future, we feel, for supporting multiple architectures and maybe multiple flavors of multiple architectures on the same system at once. Um, I know that I've had dealings with a, a number of the Fedora folks who were very keen on following uh, the same path. Um, do we have any feeling, feelings on it from the Sousa, Arch, anyone? Mm. I, I've seen that, yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Um, so, yay. Well, okay, fine. If people would like to um, know more about Multi Arch and why it's useful, uh, there's a whole bunch of information on the Debian wiki, the Ubuntu wiki, the Lenaro wiki, and generally it's good. Please do it. Um, one of the interesting parts of RMHF is that due to the existing EABI spec, RMHF demands that at least some of the base, basic system is following the multi-arch conventions. 
Um, I'll explain that slightly more in that the, the name or the, the path to the runtime linker, LD.SO, on ARM HF and ARM EL is exactly the same. Um, that is quite scary if you manage to mix them up in that if you try to run a binary with the wrong runtime linker and potentially the wrong, the wrong libraries with ARM EL and ARM HF, you won't necessarily know that you've got it wrong. It's not like if you're trying to run a Spark binary on an i386 where it will just say wrong architecture. Or if you're, t or if you're trying to run a 64-bit um, Intel binary on a 32-bit i386, where again, it will tell you that you're trying to run an invalid ELF program. ARMEL and ARMHF are close enough that the programs will run, unless you're very careful, but just give you the wrong answers. Be aware of this. So what we've done for RMHF is we have explicitly changed in um, the GCC uh, configuration the, the path to that runtime linker so that in the ELF headers of all the programs that you build for RMHF, it will actually point instead of to slash lib slash ldlinux.so.3, it will point to slash lib slash ARM Linux GNU, EAB, GNU EABI HF slash ldlinux.so.3. Um, that is going to is a major change. Be aware of it. Although you shouldn't need to be aware of it. I'm not, sorry, I'm confusing things. Um, in that you, your system, if you're going to run our MHF binaries, will need to have something in that location. But so long as either you're running a multi-arch system like Debian or Ubuntu, or you have a symlink to the correct linker in that path, your system will just work. Um, we would love if the rest of the distros follow us and do multi-arch for, you know, for the system as a whole, but be aware this is a place where if you're not careful, you might be bitten. Um, where are we? Quarter to um, We are in Lenaro, um, very interested. Oh, sorry, we have a question at the back. Mike? Mike's dead? Is it turned on? Is there a red light? Do you want to hold down the button? Um, since you just came back to RMHF, uh, the yes. benchmarks that you mentioned in the beginning, like uh, on average 30% faster, was that done on your ARM HF versus the old ARM EL, or was it done on basically ARM V7, uh, Neon, and uh, VFP, and then just difference as, as in floating point uh, versus integer registers, or was it just ARM HF versus ARM EL? Um, we have a mix of different benchmarks, I'm afraid. Um, direct benchmarks of most of this were done using Debian Army L against Ubuntu Army HF at the time. Um, there's work going on right now to redo all of those benchmarks to do directly still v7 with all of the other with the, all of the other enhancements and direct just comparing ABIs. Um, watch this space; they're, they're coming soon. Okay. Um, in terms of any, oh, go on. Um, a quick question. Does uh, ARM HF require many libc changes? For instance, in OpenWRT, we use uclibc a lot, and would it be a large effort to adjust it for HF? Um, in theory, just about nothing. Also, the only thing you will need to do is put the symlink in place so that you find the runtime linker. Okay. Um, most of ARMHF, I mean, fundamentally, the difference between ARMEL and ARMHF is just in the conventions of passing flo floating point arguments. Um, so long, if your, if your program is doing nothing special, does not do anything particularly low level, it'll literally just be a recompile. If it works on ARMEL, it'll work on ARMHF. Um, if you are doing something low level and horrible and grotty, and yes, I'm thinking of Ruby here, um, or ditto, there's, there's, there's bits and pieces of LibreOffice 
which do um, there's a there's a bridge in the middle called Uno which needs to know huge amounts of detail about your platform and your binary formats, then absolutely those are the places where, you're going, where people are going to need help to make RMHF work. Um, if you rely on the compiler to get it right, it will. Yeah, Touch just wood. remember that uh, with uh, EABI versus OABI, there were quite a few differences that had to be taken care of in, in UCLBC, and it had to implement some steps here and there that were not provided by libgcc, and I'm just wondering if something similar is going to come up for HF. Um, I don't expect anything like that. Um, you know, existing EL is already working fine on V7 with exactly the same setup. Um, RMHF is literally just the change of uh, floating point. Okay. Right. Microphone forwards. Yes. Uh, boost thread library. Uh, has 7,000 lines of codes of thread testing, and they are b based on pthread, as far as okay. I know. Okay, awesome, thank you. Perhaps it's applicable. <laughs> I'll give that a try. Um, and across here? Just quick. Which linker are you? <laughs> Sorry? Um, both gold and the normal GNU link, you know, Binutils linker should work. Um, again, there's, there isn't anything particularly special at this point that they care about. Um, we in Debian, we, we've just been following the, the, the same um, build uh, builds as, as for RML. So unless a package specifies one or the other, you know, it comes out. Right. Okay, Andrew. Uh, uh, just a quick question with regards to the uh, Lenaro evaluation builds. Yes. Are all the source packages available? Uh, for the likes of uh, primarily the kernel so that we can test our kernel builds using the same source as ones that work so we've got a, a decent reference point um, to build uh, against right. rather than just doing a git checkout right okay that's supposedly the tree that was used sure. etc um, unfortunately, I don't think they are all available packaged in the same way that we might expect in Debian or Ubuntu. There's a lot of discussion going on about that right now. At the moment, the best way of getting Lenovo kernel source is Git. And I, I wish it was different, but it, it, it's an ongoing debate. Sorry. Um, so we have a whole bunch of people in Lenovo whose job is to help with ARM knowledge and help porting software. Get very echoey. Um, if you have any, any questions about ARM, you know, whether you know, it's detailed uh, tips on how to, to get the best out of the CPU if you're writing software for it, or how to port your existing software, um, especially so if you're involved in the distro and you're, you're, you're looking for help, guidance, whatever, please, there is a, there's the cross distro uh, you know, come join us there. We try to have regular get-togethers um, at various events. I mean, like I said, this is, p is part of what we're trying to do. Um, we'll have another um, cross-distro arm boff at the Lenovo session this coming week in California. Um, if there's anything you want to know about, please ask. We might say we're not sure, but, we, but the chances are it's the best place you're going to find expert help. Um, unless there's any more questions, I think we're done. Ah. Um, in the Lenaro project, what's your um, experience with platform support, driver support from, from the vendors, the chip SOC vendors? Um, it's varied. <laughs> um, the Lenaro um, members, as I said, TI, Freescale, and, you know, and so on, um, they're all committed to providing better support, uh, upstreamable support for all of their um, system-on-chip products. Um, some are further along than others just because they've had more experience in the past. Uh, well, I'm asking because for some of the vendors, I don't see that happen. So we're into embedded systems, mm. um, smart company I work at, and 
we decided for one specific vendor because the vendor claimed um, he's, he will provide anything, do, uh, um, put things back upstream and takes care of it, but nothing of that was true basically. And That's a shame. it's one of the largest vendor of ARM SOC, so that is really a yeah. shame. Okay. Um, we're trying, um, ARM as a company wants to be seen as a good open source ci um, citizen. You know, we've got lots of really good free software developers involved to try and help with that. One of the reasons for Lenovo to happen is to help the rest of the ARM ecosystem do that. It's taking a while. Um, lots of what we have done already is starting to go upstream. Um, I mean, there's lots of people in the room will have seen the various complaints from Linus over the last 12 months about what a mess the ARM um, at, you know, part of the world is. We're working on that. We're working on, instead of just having the previous setup where most of your SOC vendors might never ship the drivers upstream, or were, to be honest, they try to put them upstream, but they were just awful code and would never be accepted. Part of the long-term goal is to get them to work together. So instead of having individual um, serial port drivers, like 25 of them, which all work identically, except for the tiny bit that doesn't, we're trying to get common core. Um, it's taking a while. We've got really bright people on it. Fingers crossed we'll get there. I was just wondering, um, at, the, at the point where you claimed that um, getting Petrus back upstream is one of the prime goals of Lanaro, because that, mm. um, I've been told by that vendor directly that uh, they don't plan doing anything like that. So it's Wonderful. weird. Yeah. That's, again, I've, I've, I've heard this from other people too. With a lot of the uh, silicon vendors, it also depends on who you talk to. There's the, bit, there's the whole big company syndrome where there might be a thousand people all working in what we consider the right direction, but unfortunately you found one of the hundred who are pulling the other way because they think this, this open source thing is shit. Mm. You know, it, it happens. Um, in in the, the long term, really, we're hoping, we're trying hard. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, and um, one more question. Earlier this week, uh, Warren East during the earnings report said uh, that um, ARM wanted to uh, react or adapt to the um, large demand in free and open tools. Do you have any details on that? Is there anything in particular coming up? Um, sorry, I don't... Yeah. Um, we have quite a number of people in ARM already working on I said the free software ecosystem. So as well as I said, I've been working on our mate Jeff in Debian Ubuntu. We also have a number of people who are working on not just improving ARM support in GCC, for example, you know, and the other tool chains, but also actively becoming part of the upstream. So we're doing the gatekeeper thing. We're doing the generally be good with the community. Um, there's a lot of that going on, and the teams involved are still growing continually. We're hiring, in fact, if anyone's interested. <laughs> so that was just, in your um, opinion, a general reference to the Lenaro efforts and no big thing coming up? Um, if there is a really big thing coming up, I'm afraid I don't know about it. <laughs> well, so one other thing that's going on is that the Consumer and, elect and Embedded uh, Working Group at the Linux Foundation that used to be the CE Linux Forum um, has been working on this thing she probably heard of the long-term stable kernel initiative. There's going to be an update um, on the progress of LTSI at uh, on the afternoon before the start of the embedded Linux conference overlapping mm -hmm. the tail end of the Android Builder Summer Summit bleh, sorry um, out in San Francisco a week and a half hence or something. Yeah. And uh, there's been lots of discussion going on with um, ARM and with various uh, silicon vendors in addition to the various um, CE companies. I don't actually know what the group is going to specifically be announcing in the way of progress that afternoon, but with the combination of Greg KH's move to the um, foundation as a, as a new fellow to work, among other things, on these stable kernel initiatives, I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't some sense that you know, that's part of the swirl of increasing support for, because a lot of the C, CE uh, working group um, companies' products are ARM-based, so mm. I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't some correlation there as well. Sure. Thanks. And I'm being told that we're out of time.
Thanks all for turning up. If you do have any more questions, please contact me.